This is the second part of a talk on spiritual warfare that I began this morning during our church service. This morning I talked about how God is greater. That is the most important thing to take away from any talk on spiritual warfare. The Bible tells us three things, that there are spiritual forces at work in the earth, that they have power and influence, and that none of them are any match for the one true God. And the church in submission to God is given authority to resist and to even to drive back these spiritual forces. There are two mistakes that Christians easily make. One is overestimating the enemy and the other is underestimating him. Still others have convinced themselves that spiritual powers do not even exist, that they are simply superstition. More commonly in the developing world, but only occasionally in the Western world, demons do manifest themselves, making their existence known. I was listening to an interview with Simon Gilbo, who is a missionary in Burundi, telling tales of his team preaching the gospel. They went to a village wanting to preach Jesus, and the village elder initially turned them away. But eventually the village said yes, but only if you heal this demon-possessed girl first. The village was saying, don't just talk a good game, show us the power. And as they prayed for her, the whole village came to watch. And as they spoke Jesus' name over her, all sorts of deep male guttural voices came from this young girl's body. She was set free. And as the village witnessed this deliverance, the village elder and many others came to Christ. I say that only to say that even though we don't see it in the West very often, the stories we read of Jesus casting out demons are not fanciful. They're not simply tall tales. Sometimes in our rather closed-minded culture, we need to hear stories from outside to remind ourselves that these things are real. The challenge in the West, however, is quite different. There is a quote in the film, The Usual Suspects, though no one's entirely sure who originally said it. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Our rational scientific Western world sees these spiritual beings as myths and ghost stories. A whole genre of Hollywood films has grown up around them. Our cultural lens says that demons don't exist, so the enemy blends in and acts in more subtle ways. Interestingly, the Bible has as much, if not more, to say to us about this kind of spiritual warfare. In 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, it says, Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This description of spiritual warfare is about ideas. It's a battle of arguments and thoughts. It's done in the public space, countering arguments, and it is done in the private space, submitting our thoughts to Christ. It is waging war on the strongholds that stand in opposition to God, in society and in our own lives. In Colossians 2.8 we read, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. You may have a footnote against elemental spiritual forces to say that this might be better translated basic principles. Could it be that the basic principles of this world are in fact spiritual forces? Materialism, that tells us there is, tells us there is nothing but matter in the universe and that we are an accidental creation of random particles colliding. Hedonism tells us that the ultimate goal of human life is the pursuit of pleasure, 
consumerism sells us satisfaction from buying things while continually making us desire more. And expressive individualism that encourages us to live out whatever corrupted desires are in our heart. These are some of the basic principles. They certainly tick the box of being hollow and deceptive. They can easily take us captive and they do not guide us to the fullness of life that God has for us. There is a spiritual force that we don't see behind these ideas. The Apostle Paul recognises principalities and powers, spiritual forces at work influencing truth and ideas. In this modern era of fake news, propaganda and controlling the agenda, we understand what it means to battle over truth. In the Gospel of John, the dominant theme in Jesus' preaching is that of truth versus lies. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And he calls the devil a liar. The devil for Jesus is not some myth or idea, but a real spiritual creature. In numerous places in John, he calls him the ruler of the, this world. The word he uses is archon or prince, the highest authority in the world. In John 8, 44, Jesus describes the devil. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Spiritual warfare to Jesus is this battle between truth and lies. Right back in the Garden of Eden, the serpent didn't come at Eve to bite her or poison her with venom. Instead, he came with an idea. He comes with a subtle deception that causes her to question who God is, who she is, and what goodness is. This seductive deception appeals to Eve. It says Eve saw the fruit was desirable. We see the devil's main plan of attack is temptation. It is derailing the plans of God by deceiving his people. John Mark Homer says, his primary strategy to drive human society into ruin is deceptive ideas that play to disordered desires. The same is true of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The devil doesn't turn up with a show of power. He comes with seductive promises and questions. Right after Jesus' baptism, when he is declared the Son of God, the devil begins, if you are the Son of God, and he plays off Jesus' desires, using them to attempt to sow ideas of rebellion in Jesus' mind. But Jesus is not tempted. An interesting parallel to this is judo. The idea in judo is to use your opponent's momentum against them. If they come running at you, you step aside and throw them, not using your strength, but using their own momentum to overbalance them. This is in some ways how the enemy attacks us. He takes energy that's already there and wants to use it against us. He takes the desires that are already there and he wants to push them to an extreme. He'll take that little doubt in you and he wants to expand it. He'll take that gnawing concern and he'll blow it up into a crushing fear. He takes your desire and turns it into an obsession. And he does this with society too. He's driven our political spectrum right to the poles of right and left, where they don't even understand one another anymore. This is the age of radicalism, of extremism, of nitpicking political correctness, of rising fear and cultural anxiety. He's been disarmed, so all he has left is to turn our own energy in the wrong directions. That's what he's doing in the garden, seducing Eve by her own desires. That's what he does in the wilderness, tempting Jesus. And that's what he'll seek to do with us. But as it says in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, we are not ignorant of his schemes, and we're not. It's important to be aware. The tools I spoke this morning of prayer and fasting, and also reading the Bible, will help to root you in the truth. 
they'll help you discern the lies you hear, whether they come from outside or from inside. When you're tempted, and we all are, call for help. And when the enemy does manage to knock you down, remember Jesus is there with grace for all those who repent. The enemy's intent is not only to cause you to sin, but to take you out the game. So get back up. This is spiritual warfare, resisting the enemy and taking our thoughts captive to Christ. The battle within is hard, but this is what we've been called to with Christ's empowering help. May God bless you.